Hey guys, guess what? I've got a crossbow. What do crossbows have to do with medieval kirtles? I don't know, but they sure are fun. Are you scared? <laughs> you should be. <laughs> hey y'all. Today I am going to be making a 15th century supportive kirtle using historical hand sewing techniques, mostly. This kirtle is going to serve as the underlayer for my medieval Maleficent costume, and this video is the first in a three-part series on the making of Maleficent. If you're interested to see the final result, make sure you subscribe to my channel so that you can see those videos once I get them up. So what is a kirtle? A kirtle is a dress that was worn starting about in the mid 14th century. It began as a loose garment which got tighter and more fitted as the outer dress styles changed. As we make our way into the early to mid 15th century, the time period that Disney used to inspire Maleficent's robe, the kirtle begins to serve as a foundation garment for the looser gown that wealthy women wore over top. Say that 10 times fast. I've seen several very good videos on kirtles here on YouTube, but most of them are made by much smaller women. And that led me to wonder, would something like this be supportive on someone built like me? I decided to try it and find out. I wanted this kirtle to be as flexible as possible, something I could wear, say, to Renaissance festivals, something that was historically adequate enough to wear to future events, and maybe even wear to the office as a history-bounding outfit. To make this dress more versatile, I decided to build it sleeveless with matching pinned-in sleeves. I live in Texas and it gets very hot here. Looking at some images from the mid-15th century, you can see that this was definitely done in the period, and it makes perfect sense. Fabric was expensive. Sleeves don't take a lot of fabric. It's a good way to change up your look without a lot of extra expense. This project is a first for me in many ways. It's my first truly historically adequate article of clothing. It's my first time hand sewing an entire garment and my first foray into medieval garb, which is a section of history I never thought I would venture into, considering my thing is late 17th century France. But this year I needed a Halloween costume that had flexible fitting garments that would be easy to alter. The simple structure and minimal seams of medieval wear fit into that criteria unlike late 17th century France. Maleficent's kirtle, which we do see in the film, and I'm going off of the animated feature here, not the live action, is a delicious berry color. However, Mood had a sale on linen this spring, and knowing that I wanted to make it out of linen, which is a rather expensive fabric, I jumped on the opportunity and ordered five yards of purple linen without looking at Maleficent's dress to confirm its color. But you know, I, I don't mind the purple, and the sail linen didn't come in that color anyway, and even on the other sites that I knew about at the time, didn't have the berry color that is canon to the film. Is this purple that I picked a purple that would have been possible in the 15th century? You know, I'm not sure. I'm not as knowledgeable about natural dyes as I am about modern day dyes. If you have a good source of information on the dyes used in the medieval period, please leave me a comment below and let me know because I had trouble finding specific information, especially about purples, which don't seem to appear much in the imagery that I found. To make this dress, I decided to use the medieval tailor's assistant to draft the pattern. They have thorough instructions for pretty much anything you want to make from the medieval period in there, including the undergarments and the headwear and the belts. The catch is, is that it's all sort of written out with the assumption that you have some basic construction knowledge. So I don't recommend it for someone who is new to sewing. If you're not new to sewing, but new to the world of medieval like me, you should be fine. Just read through everything once first before you start and take your time. To build this pattern, I needed a medieval block. A block is a pattern that fits exactly to your own measurements. In modern day fashion design, this can also be referred to as a sloper, but know that the medieval shape is different from our modern idea of the sloper. It must be fit very closely to your body with arm size close to your underarms. Making a block is best done with the help of someone else, but 
I did not have someone else. So I ended up making my block using duct tape. I filmed this with the intention of putting it in this video, but decided to make it its own separate video instead. One, because this video is already too long, and two, because that footage is pure comedic gold, and I did not want to reduce it down to a minute of time lapse. So you have that utter silliness to look forward to at a later date. I really did not want to draft out the bodice part of this kirtle. The math was hurting my head way too much. This kept me from starting the project for a long time because I was super intimidated. But I ended up finding some excellent instructions from a blog called La Cote Sample, which I've linked in the description below. She goes in depth how to drape a supportive kirtle and has two options, a curved front like the one I'm using and a straight front, which is a little tighter fitting and better for people with a smaller bust. Again, this is best done with an extra set of hands, but I did it myself off camera. And you know, it wasn't that hard. It involves putting a basted mock-up on your body and then lying down and pinching and pinning and pinching and pinning from the center front to the sides to the center back until you get a shape that is comfortable, that supports you, that looks good and doesn't have any excessive wrinkling. Once I got the shape that I wanted, I made sure that I had the line pinned nicely and then I took the mock-up off to transfer onto paper. With a marker, I drew over the pins on my bodice block. I ripped out the basting stitches and cut to the drawn lines for my final shape. Then, using some high-tech pattern weights, I traced the shape onto a sheet of paper. I'm using one color pen for the right side and another color for the left side, and tracing the lines on top of each other so I can take the average shape. Then, with my handy French curve, I smoothed out the lines to make them prettier. I repeated this process for the front, which was a little trickier. Now to draft the kirtle. Starting with the kirtle back, I used my finished pattern and traced it onto a longer piece of paper. Now, smarter jacks would have used a pen or something so you could actually see the lines I'm drawing, but unfortunately I was more focused on erasability. Oh well, it's a learning process. I then marked the center of the bodice back and drew a straight line from the neckline all the way to the bottom of the sheet of paper. Then I marked the waistline and measured from the center of the waistline down to the end of the paper and marked where I wanted the skirt to end. My length is approximately 42 inches. The MTA suggests a half skirt width of 25 inches for the back. I used those measurements to mark the width of the skirt extending from each side of the waistline. And then I used my French curve to draw out the hemline, and all that was left to do was cut it out. I did the exact same process for the front. The only difference is that the hemline is offset. Instead of 25 inches centered from the middle of the waistline, it extends 14 inches toward the side and 12 inches toward the center front. The sleeve was a little more complicated because I did a straight draft instead of draping. First, you need a few measurements. You need the sleeve length from the shoulder point to your knuckles. For me, that's about 26 inches. You need your top arm, which is the widest part of your bicep. For me, that's 15 inches. You need either the width of your wrist if you're going to do buttons or the width of your hand for a slip-on sleeve, which is what I'm doing. I've got eight inches for the measurement of the width of my hand. And you also need the circumference of the arm side of your kirtle, which is this part. And you take that, you measure that from the actual pattern that you already have. And mine was about 19 inches. I didn't do a very good job getting an exact measurement for that and it is going to cause me problems later in the video, you'll see. With these measurements, you can then draft all the basic points of the sleeve. That's the basic line, which is essentially your arm length 
run down the center of the sleeve, the wrist line, or hand line in my case, the shoulder line, and the front line, which is essentially the center front of the sleeve, because with these S-curve sleeves, the seam will be in the back. On the paper, I drew out my basic line to the length of 26 inches. I drew a perpendicular line at the top and the bottom. These are my shoulder and wrist lines. Make sure you label everything. I got a little lazy when it came to the balance points and then made it harder to assemble the finished sleeves onto the garment. From there, I marked out half of my hand size plus about three quarters of an inch or one centimeter of ease, centering on the basic line. I took my arm side measurement or sleeve head measurement and divided by five. I then marked this number down from the shoulder point at the top of the sleeve. I drew a straight line from here down to my wrist measurement. This creates the front line. I marked the same distance to the left of the shoulder point plus about an inch and a quarter or three centimeters. I'm rounding these measurements here. From there, I drew a line down about four inches or 15 centimeters and drew a line parallel to the shoulder line. On this line, I marked half of my top arm measurement, so seven and a half inches, starting from the front line. Then from there, I measured the distance between the end of that measurement to the back guideline. Using these measurements, I marked FP, or the front point, one tenth of my sleeve head measurement plus a centimeter from the shoulder line. I marked BP, or the back point, one tenth of my sleeve head measurement from the shoulder line in the opposite direction. Then I marked UP, or underarm point, one fifth of the sleeve head measurement from the shoulder line. Have you gone cross-eyed yet? I sure have. Now these proportions change depending on the width of your sleeve. If you're using the MTA to draft this, they have a very complicated but clear table that you can use. If any of you are doing this on your own and have questions for me, let me know and I'd be happy to share more details. Once these points were marked, I drew out the first half of the sleeve head using a French curve to connect the dots. La la, la la. Then I drew a tapered line from the BP mark to the other side of my wrist width. I then traced out this shape onto another sheet of paper and cut it out to draw out the other half of the sleeve. I placed it on the sleeve and then flipped it out and traced that shape to the existing paper. Et voila, the sleeve was drafted. Then it was time for the mock-up. I drew out the pattern onto an old bed sheet, which I probably should have ironed first, but eh. To save materials, I'm only cutting out the curl to a little past my hips. I repeated the process for the sleeve. Note that I'm only going to cut one out to save material. It probably would have been better to do two, but it worked. I then cut all them suckers out, machine basted the seams, and tried it on. All right, so here is the old mock-up. I am really happy with it. Um, the only adjustment I have made is to take in the back just a little bit because it was kind of, it was still kind of bubbling. Um, but otherwise, I've been wearing this for a couple of hours. I put on the sleeve. The sleeve needs a little bit of modification. Um, but otherwise, I really think I'm ready to go. It skims my hips. Let's see. Skims my hips. I was a little worried it was going to be too tight on the hips, but it is not. And um, it's comfortable. I haven't had too much downward drift, if you know what I mean, so that's good. Um, the sleeve is pulling it a little bit off of my shoulder. Uh, however, I think that is because I cut off the seam allowance on my sleeve for some strange reason. I don't know why. And so it's a little bit smaller than it should be, so it'll live a little bit higher up. And if it pulls off a little bit, that's okay because that is, I mean, that's a neckline that was happening at this point. So, um, yeah, I spent so much time trying to fit this kirtle. It took hours, but it was worth it because this mock-up is, I mean, it fits me. I'm comfortable. It doesn't wrinkle too bad. Um, so yeah. I I think we're good to go. Okay, I ran into a problem. My fabric is not wide enough for the skirts. As you can see, um, I've got this folded up here, so it's just, it's not wide enough, and I've been nagging this for a while, and I really didn't want to have to put gores in this, but um, 
I'm gonna have to. So this is the back piece and it it needs a little bit more space in the front. So I am going to place the gore on the center back seam. Um, my thinking is this length is different size than the front. Um, the, the front is only, I only need like two or three inches more to get the front all in one piece. So I'm just gonna do a little wheel piece on the side for the front portion and then the back I am going to put in the gore on the back. I just have enough. I, I did the math, I need 28 inches. So this straight, cause it has to be cut on the straight grain. So here's my little seam, seam allowance here. I folded it in and this length from here to here is 28 inches. And my hem is gonna be slightly wonky, but I will deal with that, that I can make, I can make that work. Um, so from here, to here is 28 inches, actually 28 and a half. Um, and so what, what is gonna happen is I'm gonna cut this piece here and then I'll cut this in half, put the gore in on the back from here. And I was a little scared because my sleeves um, are going to be cut from this fabric as well and I'm cutting it close, y'all. Um, but I did the math and I have about three inches of wiggle room for the sleeves, which is good because I actually have to make this a little bit wider before I cut it. Um, I'm not 100% focused on getting the sleeves done today, but I do wanna get the sides of the kirtle cut so that I can get started hand sewing them um, because time, yay. And um, this way I can work simultaneously working on the kirtle and the hoop blonde. Um, I was kinda gonna wait on the kirtle but um, I'm not going to, I'm gonna get this shit done. So yeah, that's, that's the plan. Um, it isn't what I wanted, but as they always say, piecing is period. And um, I think I have enough fabric, which is the main thing. So yeah, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get all of this cut and then pin together. And then hopefully tomorrow I can get started on sewing it together. Now I set about cutting the wheel piece. A wheel piece is a small gore that is placed at the corner of a skirt to widen the hem. Here, I'm simply matching the selvages together and cutting the piece the size of the rest of my pattern. The back gore was a little harder because my margin was so thin for getting the gore and the sleeve out of a single piece. I did some measuring and just had enough. Phew. Now for some lazy stitch marking. I used a Ponce wheel and all my tracing paper to mark the stitch lines on the other side of the fabric. Then on the front side, I marked the stitch line with a chalk pencil. I then pinned each wheel piece to the front pieces and did the same for the gores in the back. Then I was ready to start sewing. All right, champ, you got this. Float like a bee and sting like a butterfly. You can get this thing hand sewed. Are you ready? Yep, I'm ready. Good. You got your thread? Got my thread. You got your beeswax? Got my beeswax. You got your thimble? Got my thimble. All right, get ready. Get in that ring. Let's go. After back stitching the gores and wheel pieces, I ironed out the seams and folded the edges over the raw seams for felling. Before I began the side seams, I needed to cut out the lining. I didn't do this for the dress itself, 
but because this kirtle is supportive, I wanted to make sure that at least the lining was cut on green. So I began by doing my absolute favorite thing, pulling a thread. Then I traced out the stitch lines on the lining fabric using the tracing paper on the back and a friction pen on the front. Friction pens are my new favorite thing. They disappear with heat. You can find them on Amazon for relatively cheap. Here I'm marking the waist and hip line. I'm only lining it to the point slightly below my hips, both to keep this dress lightweight and to save on materials. This inner fabric I'm using is a medium weight herringbone ticking linen from Burnley and Trowbridge. It's very nice and I was hoping to have enough of it left over from this project to use for a set of stays for a future endeavor. Okay, so I have been debating for a really long time how I was going to do this and uh, I'm running out of time and I'm really stressed so I am just going to do it the simplest way I know how. I have sewed together the gore on the back and um, I have fell down one of the seams but I've left the center back seam unfelled. Um, I have sewn it all the way up to essentially like an inch lower than where my lining is going to be. And what I'm going to do from here is um, based on all of the lining pieces, I'm going to flat line it. Um, and then after all of the lining pieces are on the front and the back, I'm going to machine base it together and then I made little um, eyelid things and I am going to base that onto my center front and try everything on with just the basting stitches and make sure everything fits. Since I only did the mock-up to the hips, I'm not really sure how the skirt is going to look and I never tried it with actual eyelets, so um, this is my compromise. I'm hoping that this only takes me a short period of time. Um, I'm hoping to knock out all of the basting this evening before I eat dinner. Uh, so that's my motivation. And um, from there, if everything fits okay, um, then I can go ahead and sew up the rest of the seams. And from there, I think it's going to be smooth sailing. Knock on wood. Once everything was pinned, I used long basting stitches to secure the lining to the dress, both basting on the outside and in the center of the fabric. This is a lot of extra work, but I really wanted to make sure that everything was secure and fitted. In the end, I'm really glad I did this extra step. Then I pinned the whole dress together and machine basted all of the seams using a long stitch. Here is my kirtle, all basted up. Um, I used medium weight muslin, uh, two layers, to make these little eyelet strips. Um, I, they are really ugly. <laughs> I have red red thread on my serger right now for another project and uh, I couldn't be fussed to change the color of the thread. Um, it's going to need to happen here soon but uh, for now I've got these lovely strips um, but they do the trick and I put this on the other night after I basted it and wore it around and I, I was still getting a little downward pull happening so I took it in a full a half inch on the sides. I took it in a full inch on the center front and then in the back I took about an inch and a half out. Um, I am a little unhappy I've got like this little bubble where the dart is. Uh, I'm going to need to fix that but that'll be easy because I'm, I'm probably just going to take it in just a little bit on the center back here um, because it's only going to stretch and I would rather it start out a little too small and ease out to fit me, then start out big and do all of this work just to have it not fit in a couple of days. So um, I'm going to step back. It's really long. I thought I had measured it right, but it's it's about six inch inches down on the ground. So I'm going to have to take it up. I'm pretty happy with it and I think I'm going to go ahead and get it sewed up. I love when things go the way you want them to. Shit. Did I just jinx myself? Fun fact, make sure you view your videos after you shoot them. Don't just assume everything is good and move on. Because 
I shot this whole section assuming my mic was plugged in and working, and it was not. And I only realized it when I went to start editing. Anyway, here's a nice shot of my basted insides. For the sake of not fraying, I decided to serge the ends of the lining before I felt it up because this fabric is going to take a lot of strain and I wanted it to be as strong as possible. Now, all I have to do is turn it up once and whip it down using some linen thread. It'll stay strong and secure even if I put this in the washing machine. Dun dun dun! Here's a close-up of the lacing strip I made. I 100% recommend making one of these for any project that requires lacing. Not only did it save me a lot of time, but it gave me a chance to practice my hand-stitched eyelets before I did the real thing. And now, if I make another kirtle, I can use this again in the mock-up process. For your viewing delight, some actual hand sewing footage! I'm whipping the loose edges of the lining down to create a nice, neat edge that won't fray. After that, I pulled out the basing and hand-stitched the side seams, making sure to backstitch the bodice, though I used a running backstitch on the skirts. A weaker stitch, but much faster. Alrighty, so here is where I am straying a little bit from the historical accuracy. I have surged my seams, my edges, but as you can see, I, I've only done it, actually, I don't know if you can see that. Let's see, okay, let's go on a trip. So here's the bodice, here's the shoulder seam. The shoulder seam I'm gonna fell as I should. For the bodice, I wanted to have a little bit of flexibility. The idea being, if I need to let this out, I have a little bit of extra seam allowance here, and if I want to let it in, I don't have this tiny seam allowance that's going to fray when I pull it. So I am going to whip these down. I'm going to fold this over and just whip it lightly to the lining, but I'm not going to go through the same effort as I am with the skirt where I am going to iron this over and then trim it and fell it down and make it nice and tight. Because I don't think, you know, the, the skirt portion is not is going to be okay whether I gain or lose weight. But if I gain or lose weight in the bodice, it is going to make a huge difference. And because this is a front lacing bodice, I won't be able to modify from the center front. So I have done this on both of my side seams and my center back seam. Hopefully the surging will keep it from fraying. I didn't do a very nice job. It was kind of hard to get this through my feeder, but whatever, you know what? I think this is going to make a much more flexible garment and something that I can wear for a long time. And hopefully I will only have to take it in, but if I have to let it out, I got a little extra room in here. First, I pressed open the seams and trimmed one side down. Then I flipped the raw edges to one side and used the iron to press the longer edge over the shorter encasing all those pesky fraying ends. Then it was just a matter of, you guessed it, whip stitching those seams closed. Now for the finishing and making pretty. I ended up taking the center front in a little, so first I marked my new stitch line before removing my basted on lacing strips. I trimmed off the excess, leaving a small seam allowance. Then I pressed the raw edges inward. I continued to turn in all the raw edges, starting on one edge of the neckline and moving around using my trusty tailor's hand to help with the curvy bits. Yes, I'm doing this in the middle of ACL. Yes, I plan to bring my medieval kirtle to ACL to hand sew between sets. Yes, I got some weird looks. No, I didn't give a shit. I got all of this done in an afternoon with great lighting and good music. Then it was time to put in the eyelets. This was the most frightening bit of the whole thing, because once those holes are in, they are in. First, I marked a half inch away from the edges of the dress. Then I changed camera angles. <laughs> How do you like being on top? Using my lacing strips as a guide and my handy eyelet ruler, I marked my eyelet holes on the fabric spaced one inch apart. I then poked holes into the fabric through all layers. I used an awl, which merely moves the fibers out of the way instead of cutting with an eyelet die. This makes the opening much stronger and much less likely to fray. It is weirdly satisfying and doesn't bother your neighbors with the pounding. Please ignore the fact that I'm not poking on the white dots. Math is hard, okay? Once I finished hand sewing my eyelets, it was time to tackle the sleeves. 
Like the kirtle, I drew on the stitch line and then cut them out with the seam allowance. I have the eyelets done and I've got laced up with ribbon, which is not what I'm going to use in the final version, um, but I haven't gotten there yet. And I have one sleeve that is uh, partially sewn. I haven't felt the inside yet, um, but I have it pinned into my shoulder. Now, a couple of things I've already learned. The first is I will not be using standard pins to pin my sleeve in. Um, as you can see, it's already, uh, I don't know if you can see that. It's already poking out and poking into my skin. So I know that that is probably what they would have traditionally used. Um, but sometimes modern is better and I don't like to get poked. So I will probably be using safety pins. Not quite sure, I haven't figured that out yet. Um, the second thing is that um, it's a little tight. Um, I did that slightly intentionally because the fibers are gonna relax and also, you know, just, I wanted to make sure I had enough support. But um, my decision to do so, and I don't know if you can see, Ooh, blocking the light, but, um, <laughs> My back stitching is not quite great. I didn't fell the side seams or the center back seam, and I can't tell if the center back seam is gaping or not. I think the back is okay, but the sides are definitely gaping. So I'm gonna have to go back because I don't wanna fell those edges down. I am concerned because I'm leaving some seam allowance inside that it's gonna be bulky. So I'm gonna go and re sew those seams um, with a tighter back stitch and hopefully that'll hold. And if it doesn't hold, then I'm gonna have to go ahead and fill those down. Um, so fingers crossed for that. But I like the sleeve. I, it, I can't quite get my smock right, but um, I can fiddle with that later. Um, but here's the other thing. So I put, there we go. I put in an extra inch of seam allowance on the underarm and um, it was too much. My original plan was better. So I'm gonna take this in to where it was before and call it good. Um, otherwise, I think I'm good to go. I'm gonna finish filling down the insides of these. I'm gonna hem this up um, and hem up the inside of the sleeve, which I haven't done yet. Um, and then all that's left to do is the hem of the actual kirtle. We're getting there. I'm excited. This is my excited face. Like the skirt, I trimmed one of the raw edges, pressed both edges to one side, and then tucked the longer edge over the shorter to encase the seam. Because the skirt was so long, I marked a three inch hem on the bottom of the kirtle. Then I pressed up an inch and a half all the way around, and then pressed that width up again and pinned it. I tried it on, but it was still too long, so I ended up turning it up again twice. After hem stitching it down, I gave it a nice press. Okay, so I thought y'all might be interested. Okay, so obviously I have not made my finger loop braid yet for the center. I'm still using this ribbon. Um, but I thought you might be interested to see the finished inside. Um, as you can see, I've got this linen, the linen lining here. Okay, here's the felled shoulder sleeve or the felled shoulder seam. That's the right word, there we go. Okay, and then here is the side seam which I have left open. If you remember when I tried it on, um, the side was bursting out. So I went back and I re-sewed just the portion here where the lining is. And I did this on both sides and also the center back. And if you can see how dark the thread is, I actually doubled my thread to do the back stitching the second time around. Um, because I thought it would hold up more and I don't regret it a single moment. I think that that's a really good idea. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what the inside of the bodice looks like. It's a little bit raw, but I think that uh, leaving it open like this is going to make it really easy to take it in or let it out if I need to. And I am all about making things easier right now to take in and let out. And so here's the felled edges. Um, this is the gore at the back, okay? And there's my nice wide hem. Now I did lose a lot of width in the bottom of the skirt because I took it up so much. I'm not 100% sold on it. 
Uh, I think I'm gonna wear it around a little bit. Also, like, look at how small this wheel piece is now because I rolled it up six inches. It was like, you can't see that. It was like this before, right? But because I had rolled it up now, it's this teensy tiny little wheel piece. But that's okay. Um, like I said, I'm gonna wear this around the house for a little bit. Um, see if I like the length. If I'm still not happy with it, I might pull it down um, so that I can get the big swirly skirt. Um, it's just gonna be a question of whether I wanna trip a lot or look pretty. So um, we will see and I will show it to you in the reveal. Then all that was left to do was lace up the front using a handmade finger loop braid. After that, past Jackie decided to help future Jackie out by embroidering a mark on the shoulder line of both the sleeve and the dress, and a mark on the underarm seam of both the sleeve and the dress in a different color. This way, I can match the marks when putting the sleeves back in, and it won't take me a million years. Hey guys, guess what? I've got a crossbow. What do crossbows have to do with medieval kirtles? I don't know, but they sure are fun. Are you scared? <laughs> you should be. century hand sewn kirtle with pin in sleeves. I love this thing. It's so comfortable. The linen breathes and the color is incredible. In the future I plan to purchase some nice silk in a contrasting color and either line these sleeves or just make a separate set. That will give me three separate looks out of the same dress which is a concept that I love. That's three fresh looks Three times more I can wear this without looking like I'm wearing the same thing over and over again. And well, is it supportive? Yeah, it was very comfortable and keeping me in line right up to about the point where I filmed the reveal. <laughs> like I said previously, even not stretchy fabric will stretch out a little during wear. So I'll need to take it in again a little under the bust but it's not so bad that I felt like I wasn't being supported. As you can see from the footage that I showed, I was running around and doing all sorts of silly things and jumping off of walls. And while I did have a little downward drift, it really wasn't too bad. I would not be embarrassed to wear it out in public. And I was kind of anticipating that it was going to stretch out a little bit. Um, I'm gonna wear this for Halloween under a larger gown. Next spring when I wear this again I probably will go in and alter it a little on the sides. There were a couple of other little issues I had. I'm not 100% happy with the hem. I rolled it up pretty high and I think when I take it in I'm also gonna let down the hem at least one turn which is like an inch and a quarter. It's no I'm sorry an inch and a half. It's showing a little too much of my shoes and just doesn't 
swirl as much as I wanted. I really want to have some twirl factor with this. One other thing to note is that you can see the lining of the arm side when the sleeves are pinned in. In retrospect, I should have used a facing on the arm side instead of tunnel stitching the raw edges closed. I will probably redo this when I revisit this kernel next year. I used a finger loop braid to lace my kernel together, which is a well-documented technique from the time. And it was pretty easy to do if a little rough on my fingers. I didn't film the process because of length, but there are plenty of good tutorials out there if you want to try this yourself. I'll link to those in the description. And that's about it for me. I'm so happy with the way this turned out, even with the little little issues. It wasn't difficult to do. Um, it sewed up fairly quickly and now I have this great versatile dress I can get some real use out of. In the future I plan to fill out my medieval kit a little bit more with a veil, a wimple, maybe a hood, and some hand felted shoes which I actually already have the yarn for and had hoped to get done for Halloween but it ain't gonna happen and all of those other things are gonna be for another day. Now a note on the pinning in process. I did not expect it to take as long as it did. I wanted to use a lot of safety pins so you couldn't see the gaping. Even if you look at some of those pictures from the 15th century, you can see that they've got like gapes right on their sleeves. It's a little bit messy um, and I really wanted it to be nice and tight. So I used, I think maybe about eight or 10 safety pins per side and it took me almost a half an hour to put these suckers in. And during the reveal process, when I had to take them off, it took almost a half an hour to get the sleeves off because I was wearing the kirtle. It was, it was kind of rough because I had to do it while I was wearing it. And you know, I was in public, so I couldn't just like take it off. And you know, it also required a level of flexibility that not everybody may have. And even like, cause like getting under the arms here, it was really tough. And even doing that, cause I, I filmed the reveal last night and <laughs> my shoulder hurts. <laughs> so be warned if you are going to do pin in sleeves for a kirtle that you are going to need to give yourself some time to take the sleeves off or put the sleeves back on. I think that doing the little embroidery bits on the insides to mark my spots is gonna help a lot, but it's still gonna take some time. Thanks for watching. Please remember to hit that like button if you wanna support me. It does wonders for helping my content get seen. And with that, I'll see you next time when I go through all of the process for making Maleficent's awesome accessories, including the horns, including a glowing staff, and including a super cute velvet belt. Alrighty champ, you got this. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. No, that's not right. Alright champ, you got this. Float like a bee and bite like a butterfly. Float like a bee and sting like a butterfly. I just removed my pattern and I needed to share this, um, my chalk, only the yellow chalk, um, found its way onto my floor, like there was a dead body here. And now I'm starting to get ideas for Halloween. And pull and pinch and pull and this is not the right thing to say, let's go back. Got my thimble, let's go. Not got my thimble. Waiting for the teleprompter to move We're gonna wait for my tripod to stop wiggling. Are we wiggling? No. No. Okay. <laughs> this is my idea. This is muddy as hell.